Tim, welcome to Watch You Want and thanks for logging on. Today we're looking at the Rolex Oyster Quartz Datejust 36mm 18 karat yellow gold and stainless steel reference 17013. You can see, and if you like, you can purchase this Oyster Quartz Datejust on our website, watchyouwant.com. And if you enjoy these videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Watch You Want Inc. Now you can see on my wrist, Six and a third inches, 16 centimeters in circumference. The Oyster Quartz cuts a profile like almost no other Rolex, really more reminiscent of something like an Audemars Piguet Royal Oak or Patek Philippe Nautilus. It has that characteristic integrated bracelet and lug design with a broad cushion style case that causes it to read so much larger than the 36 millimeter round day just that I need to give some frames of reference. First, let me talk about the fit and the feel very comfortable. The bracelet is incredibly supple, beautifully finished on the top and the bottom. I always like to talk about the channels between links on the bottom. They will neither pull hair nor pinch skin, but just as important is that unlike many integrated bracelet watches from this period, the late 70s through the 1980s, this being an N series, so constructed in the early 90s, the bracelet can pull straight down around a smaller wrist. Now it's 12.5 millimeters thick, so it's no thicker than a contemporary Supercase GMT or Rolex Submariner. And the presence of that seamless taper between the case and the bracelet ensures that while it fits a smaller wrist well, it wears with the visual punch of a large watch. Now I'm gonna bring in my 41.5, almost 42 millimeter JLC Grand Memovox for comparison here. You can see that although 36 millimeters, the Oyster Quartz, because of its fully integrated design, reads all of a piece. It reads as a much larger timepiece and it holds its own against almost 42. And I should mention that the Grand Memovox case, code 146, was also used in a series of JLC sports watches. That's the kind of visual presence and charisma the Oyster Quartz case has. And I will mention that it was featured in nothing else like it in the Rolex lineup. Very special, very distinctive. You know when you're looking at an Oyster Quartz. More than that, the watch at only 42.5 millimeters lug to lug is incredibly compact, so it's almost like a bit of an optical illusion. The watch that reads large and wears small. Now I want to talk about the value that we're talking about here. Really go into depth because the Oyster Quartz is misunderstood. People tend to take any quartz watch for granted, almost look at them with contempt. And I'm telling you that you're looking straight past one of the great undiscovered collectible Rolex watches of the late 20th century. Built between 1977 and 2001, it was almost completely out of the catalog by 2004. What you need to remember is that production of these watches amounted to just over 1,000 per year during that span. So while literally millions of Submariners, Daytonas, GMTs were produced, all of the Oyster Quartz production in history amounts to about half as many watches as Patek Philippe builds in a year. This is a rare timepiece. More than that, in terms of finish and feel, it was a generation ahead of its time, maybe even two or three Rolex generations ahead. The case is substantial. There's no sense of folded, hollow, or otherwise spindly and delicate lugs. The bracelet feels like something that would have issued from Audemars Piguet or Patek Philippe. Solid, bunker-like almost, around a case with the integrity of a bank vault and the security of 100 meter, 330 foot water resistant oyster screw down crown. This is a watch that feels like a true luxury product and has immense heft in spite of the fact that it is two-tone, not full precious metal. What I also want to emphasize is that inside the watch is the greatest kept secret in high horology because the Rolex thermocompensated oyster quartz caliber, in this case 5035, is not very well understood and people don't appreciate the fact that behind these ticking hands lies a tremendous amount of traditional watchmaking. 11 jewels with traditional anglage, Cote de Genève, finishing including drawing and graining to decorate a movement that's designed to last not just the lifetime of the original owner, but many successive lifetimes. A certified quartz chronometer, that's a breed of watch that's almost unheard of. Mechanical chronometers are common, but to get a chronometer certification for a quartz movement is not only difficult and expensive, it's almost unheard of. There's basically Breitling and that's it. A few historical megas, it's an exceptionally unusual breed. And again, it's another feather in the cap of the Oyster Quartz. Moreover, the movement itself features the traditional watchmaking architecture, featuring a brass wheel train, featuring a pallet and an escape wheel. In fact, the stepper motor actually powers 
the pallet itself, which indexes the escape wheel at one hertz. So when you look at the hand, notice how it jumps and then stops. There's no stagger or waggle when it stops on each second, and that's because the pawls, traditional pawl jewels, are actually stopping the escape wheel in place once per second, starting and stopping, locking it when it comes to a halt, just like a conventional mechanical watch. But whereas those beat eight times per second, six times per second, sometimes 10, this one beats exactly, exclusively, one time per second. And yes, it does get serviced like a conventional mechanical watch in addition to the battery change. This watch has a real pedigree. Thermocompensated, it was one of the first quartz movements to feature this refinement. A temperature sensor rigged to an integrated circuit and a microprocessor, the watch is exceptionally precise, second perhaps only to the Omega Marine chronometers, a series of only about 10,000 movements total built during the mid to late 1970s. This is not just one of the most expensive and refined quartz movements of all time, it's also one of the most precise. Rolex estimated unofficially that the accuracy of this watch is better than one minute per year. On top of that, it's usable in an incredible range of temperatures and even magnetic conditions that would destroy a conventional, certainly quartz watch, and probably even most tough mechanical watches. This watch can be worn and keep its Rolex specified timing tolerances in a range of temperatures between 23 and 131 degrees Fahrenheit. That's negative five and 55 degrees Celsius. An extraordinary achievement to this day it remains one of the most incredible achievements in watchmaking on both an electronic and a mechanical side of the equation. It's also worth mentioning that keeping chronometer time to the point that you're going to lose less than a minute per year means that you're going to want the watch to run continuously to get the maximum benefit. And because it is a quartz, it has a 24-month battery life, so the longevity along with the precision works well in tandem. Now the watch is anti-magnetic within a field of 1,000 worsted, so one of the conventional weaknesses of a quartz watch, that is the susceptibility of the stepper motor magnets to depolarization, does not apply here. Very rugged, as you would expect from a Rolex sports watch. And finally, it is worth noting that as sophisticated as the watch is inside, it's also beautiful on the outside. This particular example featuring an incredibly striking combination of two-tone gold with a 18-karat yellow gold fluted bezel and a rich black dial. I always love those with gilt style golden print Rolex Oyster Quartz Datejust superlative chronometer officially certified with gorgeous aged tritium dots. This is an original tritium dial and the combination of the patinaed dot indices outboard of the gold hour markers is beautiful. The little spindles of gold, the gold coronet at 12 o'clock on that black background give this watch immense power. Simply going by the shape of the case and the integration of the bracelet, this watch has a lot of presence, a lot of personality, and it reads quite large. But when you add that black dial, you wind up with something that is truly special. As rare as these Oyster Quartz models are, one with this much charisma, individuality, the power of the black dial and the light metal, it is even more exclusive. And the fact that it doesn't have any diamond settings really appeals to me from a personal standpoint. This is an outstanding if you want to think of it as leg up on the auctions, leg up on the speculators, if you're a collector and you buy them to enjoy and you don't want to pay a premium for something that's been hyped to death, get ahead of the curve. This is the next generation of Rolex collectible. Personally, I love this watch. I don't opine, I don't editorialize, but I think this is really a diamond in the rough. And believe me, holding it in my hand, there's nothing rough about it. Will you be the one to discover the Oyster Quartz and start the next trend in collectible Rolex? I certainly hope so, and you can do it at WatchYouWant.com.